Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Manny Higgs. I'm the director of White Comps, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. Um, I'm going to let Randy Kennedy uh, do a lot of introduction to why we're here, but I just want to thank a few people. Primarily, primary information uh, for the extraordinary work they do, but also the extraordinary gesture of republishing Mary's The Old Night Movie, uh, which is one of my favorite books ever published. And uh, I've been a permanent advocate for the book as long as I've been on Instagram, so I'm very happy to see the circulation again. I feel like everybody who goes to art school should be given a copy on the day they arrive. I'm not sure it would help, <laughs> but they should be given a copy regardless. So thanks to Primary Information. Obviously, thanks to our speaker, this was Randy Kennedy, Mark McGill, who designed the book back in 1999. And it was originally published by Alger and Worth. We'd like to thank them too. And Mary's Gallery, New York 303. And obviously, Mary herself. And we have sodas at the back. There's going to be time to talk and ask questions at the end. And also, Mary's happy to sign books, which are available for the unbelievable price of $20. And uh, James from Primary Information tells me they still make money selling a book for $20, which I can't figure out. Um, so with no further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Randy Kennedy and take it from there. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. So to that, I'll just add my thanks to all of you for coming, and also to, to Matthew and White Combs for, um, for being, being the host of this tonight, and to, to Mark and Mary, um, and, and to Primary Information, um, uh, and you know, a sort of a conversation about bringing this book back into the world started about two years ago, or maybe I'm losing track because of the pandemic, but I think about two years ago, through the, the good offices of Barry Rosen, who, who led to James Hoff and, and the ball got rolling on this. Um, uh, and as Matthew said, you know, I think at this point we're uh, like a full on generation that this book has been, uh, you know, a favorite artist's book and artist memoir um, to, to artists and art lovers. And it's sort of been passed around because at a certain point, it really wasn't, it, it was very hard to find a copy. Um, and it seemed like Primary Information was the perfect uh, sort of, uh, you know, publisher and venue to have this book out in the world because for 15 years it's been gathering from many corners of the art world and the world all of these books that became, uh, that were, you know, cult favorites or beloved or influential or, or all of the three, but that became very, very hard to find and became essentially collector's items. And I, I will say that, you know, that's at what Mary's book sort of became that. The, the copy that I own, I bought at the, at the late lamented Strand Rare Book Room. So, you know, it, it became very tough to get a copy of this book and was kind of known more through word of mouth than, than through anybody actually having a copy of it. Um, uh, and I was just going to say quickly, and then I'd like to read a, a short passage so you have a, a sense of, of what the book feels like before we start, and then I'll start asking questions. But I tried to think of a book that, American or otherwise, that was like it, that does what it does, which is in a very conversational way, tell the story of an artist's life with snapshots and personal pictures and images of paintings and sculpture that carry the book along and that tell the story to, to a degree as well as the words do. And I really kind of came up empty. Um, you know, I thought there's like Frida Kahlo's diary, which has images in it, but the, but the words in that are kind of like Orphic poetry. They're really not, they're, they're hallucinatory. And then I thought of uh, Hannah Hoke's uh, memoir, but that was sort of assembled after she was gone from a, a, a biographical, autobiographical collage that she made when she was in her 80s. Um, and the closest that I could come was actually thinking about photographers who, are, who like to write and who are, love books and love making and writing books like Sally Mann or uh, Danny Lyon or Jim Goldberg. But it was very hard to think of one that functions that was made like, like Mary's. 
Um, so the, the passage that I would like to read, and it, it's not really all that long, but it's, it just, it gives, um, you'll see, it just gives this in a, three pages, it gives one of the most incredible sweeps of personal and 60s, 70s art history you might ever find in a book. So this starts when Mary uh, had just come to New York, which was 1968, right? 68. Um, and she come to New York in part because she felt like what the, the West Coast art scene was too much of a boys club. And then she says, and she writes, but, one, but when I was in town for a little while, I found out that I was not to be included in any of the shows that clocked the moment. This was for a lot of reasons. Mainly, I was a, a woman, young and naive, but arrogant, determined and a little bit rough. A rude girl in the old and the new sense of the term, very aggressive, very strong, but terrified. Being a female was definitely a disadvantage in those days when girls weren't supposed to have fun, they were supposed to be fun. It took me a long time and a lot of maturity to learn to negotiate the complexities of that situation. But at the time, I was devastated not to be included in the Anti-Illusion, a turning point show in 1969 at the Whitney. As a result, I abandoned the sculpture work, work I was doing, and as a rebellious move, switched to the much maligned practice of painting. Color field painting was going on then, and I hated it. I love it now. What I turned to was, materi was a materials-based sort of conceptual, anti-aesthetic, earth-colored, ironic painting that was often hard to look at. I had arrived in the summer of 1968. I remember looking out of my window into the loft across the street and seeing the Chicago riots and the Democratic Convention on the TV there. I went to Max's Kansas City where I met everybody. Robert Smithson, Ted Castle, Dan Graham, Lee Lozano, Carl Andre, Jackie Windsor, Tina Gerard, Dickie Landry, who's here tonight, um, and probably others that I'm, I'm missing, Dennis Oppenheim, Neil Jenny, John Duff. In the back room, under the red light of the Dan Flavin piece in the corner, you could see the Warhol entourage, but Andy, who had been shot that early, earlier that summer, was not there. The win I lived on West Broadway and Duane Street, which was then the butter and egg neighborhood. And around the corner on Greenwich Street, you could always see and smell big piles of smashed eggs. It was a wilderness out there because the old Washington market had been demolished. So there were vacant lots, open space, weeds, even trees, parts of wrecked buildings, field-like stretches leading out to the elevated West Side Highway. There were people living there in encampments. One guy, Dooley, was our friend, and we always gave him money making him promise to buy food, but then later he was always drunk. We hung out at the Four Eds Bar, which later became Barney's, the 80s new wave place. We ate breakfast at the Tower Cafeteria, now the Odeon. I lived there a year and then decided to move to a building in Chinatown on Chatham Square with Michael Kern, Tina Gerard, and Dickie Landry. This building was a wreck. It had been vacant for years. It was dark, there were big holes in the floor. The windows were boarded up because they were all broken. There was a kitchen in one lot that had layers of hardened cooking grease on the walls and floor where a stove had once stood. The grease was so thick that when, when we were gouging in a way, we found the shriveled, preserved corpse of a rat buried in it. <laughs> the drains were rotted. The water pipes corroded. It smelled. Stray cats lived there. The electricity was still turned on, and occasionally a, a bare, dim light bulb hung down. The gas was still on too, which caused us trouble later because we never bothered to change the name on the account and then we had to pay a huge bill. I was so traumatized by the prospect of getting this derelict place into shape and by the thought of sleeping in it that I stayed on and on at West Broadway. Susan Rothenberg, who had just arrived in town, rented my place and had moved in before I moved out and she had to, she had to camp there, sleeping on a mattress on the floor. Finally, she told me I had to leave. She'd been paying the rent for two months. Still, Susan and I became friends and drinking buddies. I used to ride my bike across Worth Street from Chinatown to visit her. In the Chatham Square building, we rented six floors above a cigar store. A dusty glass sign over the door said, Choose Family Association. In the past, immigrants from China had lived there as they worked their way out of indentured servitude. Sometimes they stayed there for years. 
In our time, artists arriving from all over stayed there for long or short periods as they became adjusted to living in New York. There was the Louisiana contingent, the friends of Dickey, Robert Prado, Richard Peck, John Smith, and Rusty Gilder, musicians who'd come to New York to play in the newly formed Philip Glass Ensemble. There were the Europeans, traveling artists, mainly members of the Arte Povera movement or the art and language groups. Emilio Prini, Germano Chalant, Kathy Bigelow, Lawrence Wiener, Joseph Casu. There were Colombian NYU students, people from the West Coast, mainly conceptual artists from LA. William Wegman, John Baldessari, John Knight. Alan Serrett brought Gordon Matta Clark around after he graduated from Cornell. There were Chinese kids from the neighborhood who wandered in just because they heard the music. And I think that, you know, that's quite a sweet history there. <laughs> <laughs> so I would just start by, I've heard you two talk about it a little bit before, but Mary, when did, when did the idea of doing a book this way come about? Well, um, way back then, at that time, um, I, I was really close to Mark. He'd been my boyfriend, but we'd broken up, and but we still kind of liked each other. And um, Mark was working in, uh, as a um, graphic designer. It was in the 90s, and so it was, um, the, it was just the end of the cut and paste era. And he actually was working for a graphic designer that was a Swiss guy who didn't believe in cutting. And yeah. digital, right? right? Yeah. And so, even though Mark had a computer, and um, I got one too, we decided to make this book the All Night Movie. And I don't think we, I had already written the story. Like I clapped it on my little Smith typewriter in 1990, out in Long Island. I'd rent a house in, in Bridgehampton, in the winter when they were really cheap. And uh, I wrote a lot of this on there. So, Mark and I decided to work on the book together. And so, uh, we did. <laughs> and when did, the, when did the title, The All Night Movie, I mean, which it, to a degree is suggested in here, but it's never really overtly, you know, talked about. Like, w when did that, it was a painting, obviously. And, but when did that title come to you? That's a good question. Because it's so evocative. Remember? Yeah, I think um, something, you, you know, you mentioned it's Mary's narrative and illustrations and snapshots. There's also a soundtrack in the book because she taught, all through she talks about the music that was going on and how it kept shifting her view of the world, I think, and how it affected her emotionally. And you can see it like we ghosted some of the song titles or some lyrics. Yeah. Let Me Go Lover was the one that right. really struck you. Yeah. And like when you were a girl, so, the song Avalon, right? What? I love an Avalon. Yeah, right. Um, we, we lived down in L we lived in Southern California. So that's where Catalina and Avalon come into the picture. If we have many hours to sit here, you're going to hear a real long story. But don't worry, we'll tell it fast. But do, do you remember when the All Night Movie, I mean, had you gone to an All Night Movie screening? or like what? I don't know, do you remember how that title came up? I think, well, it was, we had the painting. And the then we were also talking about um, a sequel. Oh. <laughs> this was, a, you know, it was going to be a series, like a, you know, Star Wars, a whole bunch of books yeah, from Mary. Right. So that was the other part. And then, um, <laughs> you know, this is, this is what you see if you're in the movie theater in the audience. And this is what you see if you're behind the screen, right? So, yeah. And in between. Or if you're high. <laughs> <laughs> right. so, so I think that, that, I'm not making this up, right? This is what we were talking about. Yeah. I know it sounds like I'm no, no, just make it up. <laughs> but there was, you know, there was also a thing at the way back in the fifties, the all night movie, right? It was on, on like some channel, movie channel. There was before the movie channel, and they would show movies all night, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. I think Remember I did that? hear about that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> 
And and so you you had already written the words, but then when when in the discussion between you and Mark did did the sort of the photographs and you know the the snapshots, the pictures, and then the paintings come into it that way. I mean, you you had you were a founder of Bomb Magazine, and so you, I, there's there are parts of this where I think there is a little bit of a feel that that kind of handmade feel that Bomb had and has had. And I, and I wonder, you know, did it, when you're thinking about how to put it together where it begins to feel, not like a scrapbook, but, but like maybe a high-end scrapbook, like when did that come along? I think that was because of Photoshop. Yeah. Because that was something Mary really fell for in a yeah. big way because you could do stuff to photos. Yeah, right. And, um, and we had the computer, the Mac, it was more the, I think you have framed, you framed the receipt from that first computer, right? I do, I have yes, that. in your studio. Yeah, right. So, you know, it, it gave us this ability to like mush stuff around <clears throat> that in the cut and paste days that Mary was talking about where you would, you know, you'd send type out to a typographer and come back in, in these sheets and you have to cut it and paint, paste it down. And it was very hard to like, mush stuff around and I think one of the things of Mary, if you've seen her work, is she likes to mush stuff around. <laughs> the other part of the story is that um, new uh, publications were coming out. My favorite one was Ray Dunn Magazine. And um, I loved it how, every, how everything was, the pictures were all on top of each other and as the magazine went along it got crazier and crazier. And I really liked that. And since Mark was working for Massimo Vignelli, this super, really brilliant, but seriously Swiss um, uh, graphics guy, who did not want to use a computer in his publication. Right? When he saw Ray Gun, he said, that is zombiness. <laughs> he said, that's what? Zombiness. 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 Because they, everything for him was the grid. You, if you yeah. didn't have a grid, like, where do you go? Where do you right. start? And you know, I never heard of that. <laughs> Mary was, Mary was the, the thing that I think, well, it's good when you get to work with your favorite person. That's the first thing, right? Mm -hmm. And the second thing is we had this relationship where Mary would say, how about, and I would say, sure, why not? So we would go back and forth like that. But I know, she said we say, were no, in. we can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> so we would and then she would say, please. Would yeah, because it, it doesn't really look like Ray Gunn. No. And I think that's better. <laughs> and, wait, and I remember you, you told me that Mary's studio, you designed it in Quark? Yeah, Quark. Which, what, like, Which when is did, vintage. Yeah. With Quark 1.0. Probably most people don't. I barely remember Quark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they went, and so what the process was you're sitting you, you're sitting there looking at photos that have not been scanned yet and you're thinking and you're looking at a screen and you're you're looking at pages and then eventually you're moving around the, the photos on the screen uh, yeah but it really started with Mary's narrative her her autobiography it kind that of the story tell yeah. that was the story and then we kind of you know, it, it goes through decades, so we kind of broke it up in that way, and each decade has a different color and a kind of photos that go along with it. So I, I think when you, in your intro, you said it very well, it, it, it tells this story in, in a bunch of different dimensions, including the soundtrack that I mentioned. Yeah. So that kind of helped us along a lot. And then, you know, I did have a grid, I have to confess. <laughs> Massimo <laughs> made you have a grid. No, but you can, if you go through, you'll see sometimes the grid takes a back seat. So. Yeah. And we use a, we didn't, you know, Raygun used, they, you know, there were about 100 fonts in that day, digital fonts, now there's millions. And they used them all, right? We kind of limited our palette in that way. Right. right. But there's a couple and, of squirrely fonts in there. <laughs> and Mary, were you, um, that means I think the other reason that the book is sort of unique is that it's using primarily abstract paintings to show, to, to tell a story, and you're showing how those paintings emotionally and visually and everything were markers of your life and what you were thinking about, what you are doing, what you wanted at that point. Yeah. And was that important to you to show 
the, con the content, for lack of a better word, of, of abstract painting? Yes, that's right. And uh, to give it kind of a backstory, so um, and so most of my paintings do have titles, so that if you spend time with them, um, and especially in say in a gallery, and f in fact that's why later on I just started designing furniture to go with my art, so that that people would sit down and stay there for a while and think about the story, the backstory behind the paintings. And lots of times you see the title and that makes it come up. But then you make up the whole rest of the story yourself, especially if you read gossip magazines and look at Instagram nowadays. You get a lot more info. <laughs> um, you, when this whole process started and James and I were sitting in the studio, you, you talked a little bit about the, the actual process of getting it published, which happened in Switzerland. And, oh, and I think, and there was like, I think, I, I seem to recall you told me about a drive that you made to the aptly named town of Books. <laughs> of Books. And so maybe tell a little bit about that. that yeah. I mean, you were, you went, we went, you, on, went on press. You, you drove to the, to the printer. No, I, we took a train, actually. Oh. Yeah, we took a train. We took a train. Somebody met us there. We were in... We, we, were, we were staying in Zurich. Yeah. And we went to went, Books. Which is um, way far, you know, yeah, quite a ways away. And um, that's where we were going to print it, so we went on press. And um, so these are Swiss printers. That already should tell you something like that. <laughs> right? They were sort of old-fashioned. Yeah, they had the blue jumpsuits, and they had thing called the Heidelberg Press. It's it's longer than this built room, right? And you know, it's about eight to ten feet tall. So in New York, you know, because I've been to a lot of printers, they do something called make ready. So they have a big roll at one end and it runs through the press and there's four colors and you have to get them all to line up to register. So they run in these sheets, right? In New York you have to stack this boom 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 and finally okay it looks like it's registered. So we show up and they say, okay, we will make the make ready, right? Boom, 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 boom. And then they told, pull the sheet out, totally registered, right? Now, they, maybe they ran a bunch of sheets before, but... Oh, you mean they did it first try? They, no, but they did it for our benefit. So oh. the other thing, I hope this is not too techy, but... Because um, we had a great time. It was, they were great. So the other thing with books is, you know, they're printed in signatures, so there's a... They have this big sheet, you know, that's maybe not eight pages or something, and then they fold it and cut it, and then there's another sheet. And they have to. Can you can hold this for a second? I just want to find it. Hang on. Okay. So here, here's one example. So the, these are, you know, on two different sheets, right? And But the paintings kind of are you know, it's supposed to match up. So they would pull these signatures, they would cut them, pull them by hand, you know, just to, to show us. And then they would lay down, because we did things like bleeds, bleeds across the signature. So these guys would um, take, take the thing, they take pull a sheet, they cut it, they fold it, and then they'd take the two signatures and put them together like this, and then they'd stand back and look. Any problems? <laughs> so, and, and they're Swiss. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, they were fantastic, and we had the, the, the scans were done in Switzerland, too. The, you know, Mary had, she's always had a great archive of photographs of her work in 4 by 5 transparencies, so back then, when you scan something, it took up a lot of gigabytes, and back then, the thing you could store it on was this big, so we took all the four by fives over there, and they scanned them, and they, you know, they came out, per you know, perfectly, of course. So. Yeah. yeah. So we spent a few days there while they ran the whole book, and you know, of course, we're the clients, so they would take us to this room where you have the perfect lighting. You know, it's supposed to be like daylight, simulate daylight, and show it to us, and again, stand back like this. Any problems? <laughs> <laughs> They're switched, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so. So that was that was books, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we, I think we made three trips, not to books, but just kind of in Back the process forth, to yeah. get the scans done and, yeah. and all that stuff. It's a good story. Yeah. Hope and you like it. I was going to ask you. 
I was going to ask you too, Mary. Like by the time you started writing the text of that, and you know, before it started to come together on the pages, a, a lot of those sort of groups and scenes, and even some of the people that you were writing about were gone, or 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 had passed along, or like like you know, you write very movingly about your friend Norman Fisher, right? And um, and but but even sort of some of those social scenes had, you know, people had gotten older and. And they, they, those things were not the way they were anymore. And was that, you know, did that book sort of mark a period for you? I think so. Yeah, maybe partly the all night movie feeling about that it was a, the end, you know. I mean, we lost a lot, of, and you know, we were all kind of <clears throat> hard partiers, so accidents happened and um, people disappeared and stuff like that. That was kind of the feeling of the backstory in that time. That was the 70s, let me think. Yeah, right, I was remembering the 70s, and um, I don't know, I just feel yeah. the vibe of the... Yeah, it was Norman and... Uh, Norman was a drug dealer, by the way, so that was a big <laughs> loss. It was mainly Gordy, Gordy Mata Clark. He uh, just um, died, Harris. right, yeah. yeah. It was kind of a lead up. A, a, a lot of really important people in yeah. the game. Which was called the Manson family at the time. <laughs> <laughs> the East but Coast the, version the, of the, the Manson. The chance where people. No, a little after, after that, right? Oh, no, after yeah. that. After Mary moves from Chavez. Your, your friend, John Duff. Mary, who you introduced me to, who you know, who has that studio on the top floor on Doyer Street, yes. talked about, and I couldn't do the geography in my head, but then I understood it that he would he would go up on the roof and then go across the roofs and then come down into your window. And and the fire Street. escape. The fire escape. Yeah. Right. So Did I tell all, you that? No, he told me Ooh, that. John, <laughs> John Duff. Maybe I shouldn't be telling. No. Don't put now. it on Instagram. <laughs> But it, but it was a, you know, a very, I mean, there was a, a huge number of people who crossed through those places, but um, it was a, 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 a very small part of the city, ultimately. Yeah, the, yeah. It was like um, the edge of Chinatown, and then the, the Bowery ended right there, and, and, and at that time, not much else was going on around there, except us. And, and when the book came out, what was the, I mean, how did people receive it? Because I'm sure, to a degree, some of that history was pretty new to people in the late 90s. Some of it had taken place, you know, quite a few years before. Yeah. Yeah, well, it started with when I started, so it started, like, from growing up in San Francisco, and <coughs> it was during the Second World War, and we lived down in, in San Francisco, right near the beach, and so we'd have to hide when um, they were scared that the, we were going to get bombed. Air raid, air. Yeah, the blackouts. Blackouts, yeah. yeah. But um, let's see, so that whole 60, se I came here in 68, so this is mainly about the 70s and then getting into the 80s. And um, and then things started changing in the art world and in the with us, um, Chatham Square had sort of ended. People, we all started moving out of there, and that and that was intense. And then um, I moved over to Tribeca, which really didn't quite have that name yet, I don't think. And and oh, and that was another place like nobody wanted. Ch Chatham Square was pretty cool. It was such a good bargain when we got this whole building. But um, nobody wanted to move into um, ratty old Tribeca, <laughs> which we got that right. <laughs> and because it was just dark and empty warehouse. So I got this, this, we found this big warehouse and so we, a bunch of people moved into those lofts then. And then that's where we were when I, when we worked on the book, and Mark lived right down the street from there. One, one thing that strikes me 
looking at the book is you're telling the story of a painter during a decade when you know painting was really supposed to be dead right. and had been declared dead and, and but the way that you and other painters many of them women were you know were the, the painters and artists in the 70s who were conceptual artists and performance artists and doing things that were supposed to be anti-painting were uh, you know, very close and looking at, at one another's work. Um, and like, what do you, in those years, when you go back and look at the book now, how hard was it to be a painter? I mean, you say you chose it to a degree at the beginning almost perversely. That's right, I was gonna just say that. And because I really loved the New York art scene, like Smithson and Andre and Donald Judd, and and I remember, um, and I was kind of like that. I wanted to be ornery and provocative. So I remember telling Smithson that I studied with David Hockney at Berkeley, which was awesome. It was, and we were all sculptors, uh, doing like rough, you know, well, night like classical sculpture. Work cast bronze and welding and and um, none of the painting painting students took Hockney's class because they were all super conservative some abstract some realistic painters so the class was full of all these sculptors I mean it was a seminar and though there were about 12 of us it was amazing and when you told Smithson that you'd studied with Hockney he said, I can't believe we're even talking about it. <laughs> 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 so I that was cool. <laughs> he was great. Um, great teacher, you know, we learned a lot. He could talk about everything. Yeah. And, and you, well, that was at the same time you were studying with Peter Volkos? That's right. And, and that was another part of Berkeley. I went there to do sculpture. And, and, and ceramics. I was an English major as an undergraduate, and, and then I, st I took up throwing pots just for fun. And, and that's like a sport, you know, I could do it. I was really good at it straight away. And so then, <clears throat> I was really bad, all C's, just never took studying or doing anything in school very seriously. I was, I was wanting to be a writer, and I was actually pretty good at that, but, but when it came to really, uh, you know, stu studying criticism and theory and everything for literature, well, I did pass, but that's barely. And so, um, then I could, I, I met people who knew me and saw, saw my ceramic work and, and got me into Berkeley to graduate school. So, and that was at, at, at uh, Santa Barbara and then also up in, in San Francisco. Yeah, and I think that you've told me before about Volkos's, like the, his teaching methods ended up kind of having an influence on the way you oh. thought about painting because he would, he would just, he would take a pot off a wheel and just throw it and then, I mean. When he'd trip, he'd pull, pretend he tripped and he'd drop it on the floor and if he sent me through that was about this tall and then it would squish on the floor, and then he'd pick it up and sculpt it into a, another pot. And um, yes, that made a big impression. Yeah. That you could have that kind of playful attitude about how you worked on your art. And the book's kind of like that, too. Yeah. The book is kind of um, um, provocative and sarcastic. and got some secrets and backstories. Yeah. And then and then you think by the time the book came out in the late 90s painting <laughs> painting had, you know, roared back and you 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 had you were, you know, you had a big career and so you're recounting these years when I don't know, there was for painters it was if you were kind of in the wilderness for a while, but yeah, it seemed like a fun better. wilderness to be in. It got better. I um, I just started to figure it out. I, st I, you know, I was a big party girl. The only time I'd really connect with people would would be if I was high or drunk. Otherwise, I was just a, like a quiet loner in my studio doing my work. And so, 
when that stopped, when I got clean and sober, my life opened up socially and I started to actually notice other people. And um, that worked out. <laughs> um, I, I think, I mean, we could, we might open it up to questions. I mean, I think that we're, uh, those are, that have kind of gone through mine and it might be interesting to see what people want to hear about. Yeah, got we're supposed to get all the deep, dark secrets out of us, so oh, we got to leave it up I to got, I got a couple, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm bad, I don't know how to keep quiet. <laughs> Questions? Well, the first one's always the longest one. I know some of those secrets. Wow. <laughs> and I was reading the book just looking for this. And I thought, well, you only told this one. You should have told that one. I want you guys to make the next book. Yeah. With those secrets. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've told me that you, you, off and on, you've been working on a kind of a sequel to it, right? To, I mean, take, picking up where you left off? I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, also we are going to make a movie. So that's pretty cool. And that's in the works now. Yeah. Which is partly derived from this, but there's a lot more storage now. Well, the filmmaker's been very inspired by the Almighty movie. That's right. I mean, maybe he we'll talks even... about using that as his inspiration. Yeah. Right? We already have the soundtrack, so it's good. <laughs> the soundtrack and the fact that the book is non-linear, non, -linear, non um, you know. Visual. Yeah. Is that is that going to be a narrative film or a documentary? Or? It's not. A, it's not a documentary. It's yeah. like, you know, this Elvis movie, which I just have seen a few times. Yeah. <clears throat> That's so cool how it jumps all around all the time. And, and so that's something that's going on in the film culture now. And so I hope, I'm sure that <clears throat> when I was, when we just started working on the film, I was, I thought I was going to have to really like tell them how to do it and everything with good luck, you know. And it's not just me sitting on a coach, couch talking about my life. I think it's going to be good. It's got sound and... <laughs> That's pretty much derived from this. Who's, who plays Norman Fisher? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't think Norman's in it. Oh. It's, more, it's a little more current than that. Matthew? I have a question related to something that Randy mentioned a little earlier that I'm not 100% sure about the result, but two parts. One, did you have a book launch? For the book originally in 1999, and if you, if you did have a book launch, where did it happen? I don't know. Did we, we? There was a big party in Zurich, as I remember, like they oh, rented yeah. some industrial hall by the river. Yeah, that yeah. was cool. And by the way, that this book went along with a show that I did at, at Hauserworth Gallery in, in Zurich, which is in a big um, warehouse. That was an industrial warehouse in Zurich. So, the, and then we showed something. We had, oh, we had. Oh, oh, right, we showed movies, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. To go along with. Do you remember which movie? Oh, it was, you know. Um, Road movies, weren't they? Yeah, it was the guy, you know, the one that. No. <laughs> no. Two Lane Blacktop? No, but it could have been too late. But, uh, <clears throat> vanishing point? Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> right, so this broke. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, we should have reversed. <laughs> the, the, the second but, part of my question, to something Randy spoke is, do you remember what the reception for the book was at the time? Because when I came across the book in the very early 2000s, almost by accident in London, the book oh. wasn't a known book. You know, I, I, did, I came across it, and it's slightly pre-internet. It's pre-internet booksellers. It's pre-social media. Yes. So, like Wendy mentioned in his introduction, the, the book was quite elusive. And I'm just curious to how the book landed at the time, given you were talking about so many people who are still alive in New York and around. Yeah. No, it was a little bit undercover, and it actually see wasn't really. It was really published as a. 
created as a show catalog. So there was no um, agency or uh, public relations or anything like that. So it was a little bit under the yeah. hiding uh, On this side thing. of the ocean, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, that might have been part of the way it got received, was that it, it was a European book to begin with, in a way, mm -hmm. and was m more available there than it was here for a while. I don't even remember, do you remember how many, what was the print run? Not so many. But it lasted for a while. Yeah. Someone raised their hand back there. Yeah, that was actually my question as well. <laughs> oh, about, yeah. about the print run? The print run, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it was, I don't know, I'm guessing like 1,500. It was, it was pretty small. And then because it's bilingual, because it's also in German, did, did, it find a, did it find a kind of a German audience too? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, nothing, no promotion, no talks like this, or as far as I can remember. Um, as I say, I was a little bit spaced. Let's see, we started in, no, no, I was already up. We, 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 I think we started in like 95. Started. Yeah. I mean, it finally got to Work really, 99. 95. We've been working on it for a long time. Off and on for that long. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. 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 In my studio yeah. in Greenwich. Greenwich Street, yeah. Yeah, oh, it was it was a while, right? I mean, it wasn't arduous; it was fun. But. Well, and, was, and were there times at, at which you kind of, you know, you you wanted it a certain way, and Mary didn't, or vice versa, and you kind of had to wrestle it out? We had to negotiate a little bit. Yeah, but I don't. I, I we worked it out. Yeah, and I don't think it was ever like my way or the highway at all. It was. I, I, I'm telling you what I experienced, and we talked about this last year was that was this thing of you know do you think we could and you know yeah why not or let's try it. we were, we were trying stuff which was what the freedom the computer gave us if we if it looked stupid you know you hit the erase or back backspace button and it goes away and you start again which is, yeah, we designed so we were yeah we were playing around with it which is that was the fun thing we had the tools early on the photoshop and the cork and uh, we had some other thing that, so, oh, okay, because we had a database. We started, we set up a database of Mary's work in the original FileMaker. And then there was a program you could read the database into Quark. So we had all this stuff. And so there was no, like, oh my gosh, we got to get it right the first time. No. So. Just crinkle it up and throw it away. Yeah. yeah. So, and there was a lot of scanning and fooling around. And, Photoshopping, like we made that whole, there's a collage in there of all these snapshots. Yeah. A lot of it's sort of out in the West. Yeah, and that was all we just prayer. kind of, yeah, we just played around with it. So. Which, I was looking back, you know, at your work at Bomb and, you know, like interviews that you had done over the years with like people like Kathy Acker and Rockets Red Glare and <laughs> Billy Sullivan. And so, I mean, the, to, to a degree, this must have been. It, it's Mary's words. It wasn't you weren't in a, con a bomb conversation with her, but in a way, this was like a you know there was a conversation oh, going on, a visual conversation, and yeah, you were helping her tell a story. Yeah, I think it's still going on. <coughs> yeah, but yeah, it was a, yeah. I think that flexibility was also what a conversation is. You say something, I say something, you know, and something else happens. So that's definitely how we I believe we worked, and that's why it was so fun. Call it a boss, but <laughs> not, not. And it's still fun. Um, I mean, just sitting here feeling the energy of the whole story and um, one twelve green, the beginning of this gallery and the memories and the whole story, which is yeah, about fifty years. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the things I remember most about the retrospective at the new museum a bunch of years ago was the slideshow that you created oh, with the uh, snapshots and the paintings and juxtaposition. Yeah. And that, that happened to, here it's mostly autobiographical in conjunction, but 
I guess I just wonder about that process of joining painting to photographs. That well, um, the, the, that's a good question because <clears throat> when I first got these invitations to do like visiting artist things at, at schools and give my slideshow, the first one was was um, it was in Colorado and I was showing the, in, in a fairly small room and I had the one projector, slides, and I, you know, they'd go through, and then I'd tell about the painting, old oil paint on canvas, 24 by 18. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they're all like, some of them were asleep, you know. <laughs> so then I'm, I'm freaking into listening to music on the radio, and so I had two, I got two, cas a cassette player where you had to put two little, cassettes in and, and so I made this music mix and so the next gig that I had to give my slideshow I showed them like sort of automatically like that I think one anyway somehow I did it so that they went back they went on together and then I just started getting invited to be visiting artists all over the place. <laughs> and they liked it. They didn't fall asleep and they laughed and they asked questions and and actually the whole time a big part of my life was teaching. And so um, like I love that kind of personal theatrical exchange that you have when you're working about trying to talk about art to people who are trying to learn about art or trying to figure it out. I remember when you did a show at Hauser a few years ago, we went to LA together, and you had a room, right, when sort of, you you know, you hear it as you were coming into the show, but there was a, a room with an incredible John Cale, a pretty early John Cale post-Velvet song yes. on a loop. Yeah. And, and, I, and I just watched people, you know, they would just kind of, they, they, they wouldn't miss it. They would just sort of hear the song and go in and sit in the room, and it kind of, set the stage for what they're about to see. Yeah, it's a great great. combo of the music and the visuals and stills and movie. And so you got to come and see the movie when it comes out. <laughs> when is it coming out? Well, probably in maybe a year. Right? Yes. <laughs> All right, the boss is over there. <laughs> the producer is there. It's currently being edited in Paris with a great editor. So it's what did you say? It's currently being edited in Paris with a great editor. In Paris? So in motion. Yeah. Well, the oh, editor yeah. is based in Paris. Matt Curry is, based in the yeah. is over there and his editor is yeah. over there. Watch out for the Galois in the editing room. Yeah. <laughs> They're certainly deeply inspired by this great book. Huh. Cool how it goes together doing um, traditional painting and, and sculpture and teaching art in art schools or colleges and doing the work and doing all kinds of other stuff to go along with it. It's a really, and the culture is that way. It's all opening up so that the edges aren't so um, defined. I think what's going on with movies right now is amazing how it's getting all mixed up. Um, I love seeing them in theaters. I hope that doesn't end in the big dark room with the big huge screen. Oh, well, you know, I watch my watch movies on my big screen in my house in my studio, and I, you know, I'm about this far away from it. I like that a lot too. <laughs> I was trying to think, did you, other than this book, I mean, there have been a lot of books devoted to your work, but other than this book, was there another artist book that you've done? You did one, was there one, um, maybe there was one, I don't, maybe it was not done by you, but it was the the, 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 the book of night, where you, you were turning oh, the yeah. pages of the big book yeah. at the Whitney, maybe? Well, that is when I first came to New York. And then that got made into an artist book? That, um, that was for 303 now. It was three yeah. The Book of Night? Yeah, they made the little edition. Oh, the, yes, we did do a small version of that, right. But when I first came to New York, I, 
I had this opportunity to work at the Art Resources Center that the Whitney has, or had, I don't know if they still have it. And so I, I made this great big book, um, which was about the stars. And actually there's gonna be, I won't keep telling the whole thing, because there's gonna be a show that's gonna include um, the work that I made about the night sky and the, and the stars uh, next, next uh, spring at DIA. Two years. In three years? Two, Two years. years, yeah. Not next spring, the following. And they're gonna show the sculptures of, of night that I've done. But really, this is the only artist book that you, you've done. Well, with a text. Sometimes they, when they've done um, catalogs, we've had some that have been inspired by this, the, the design and the idea of this book. Yeah. Like we did the show at the White Chapel in, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. London that was um, very, uh, the, the installation and the catalog were very, feeling very biographical. And there was the one book, that German guy, I can't remember his name, who regularly approaches artists to do books. And you did, it was the first time you ever used the road imagery. It's called like seeing, it's pale blue. Mm. And you chose the images and you wrote something for that. Oh, right, it's and a small little one. Yeah. Well, and then for the completists in the room, is that there's also a small green book yeah. that's called The All Night Movie that has no images in it, but it's just the text in English. Oh, right? yeah, we did that. That was accompanying a show or something. Well, that was Lydia Yee's idea because the book was out of print. Uh, so when she did looking um, at pictures of the White Chapel, she said, let's republish just the text from The All Night Movie. Oh, that's right. kind of a quickie way to get it out there, like Matthew says. Again. I just have one question that might bring us into the very present tense, and you just opened your amazing show at 303 Gallery last week, and maybe you could just speak to that body of work, which seemed to me to have this really amazing raw, visceral energy, which Thank you. suggests that's the way you are right yeah, now. Yeah, it's true, you know, and that reason that that show is, is so great is that, not that I'm just a total genius, but that... <laughs> The community that we have around uh, 303 Gallery, which I've been hooked up for a really long time. I, I have Hauser, Worth, and 303, and we had to really negotiate to make that be possible. And that's working out fine. And um, the show is designed in a very kind of uh, fluid, loose way. We, and we all worked on it together. In, including thinking about what paintings I wanted to even do some new paintings for that show especially. And the room is a beautiful big white square cube, rectangle, and we all worked on doing the installation together. So it has the same kind of like autobiographical or biographical vibe that the book has. So we all did it together. It's not well, just one genius hiding up in an <laughs> attic all by herself and then shipping it out to the gallery. It was a great experience. So go check it out. Oh, you know what else? The other thing I'm thinking about, it's um, really new that the idea of um, of uh, marketing and, and value and all of that in, in connection with our shows is kind of new in my thinking. When I was like beginning, I was just a poor hippie and, and um, nothing cost very much. You didn't have to make any money. So this style of new way of being an artist is a lot, is new, it's different. But I go for both of them. <laughs> it's working out. <laughs> But working as a community doing the show is, is really kind of unique and really beautiful. All right. Last chance for questions. I have one question. Yes. Um, I, 
you kind of answered it already because I was going to ask you if you feel differently about the time at 112 Marine and now. Yes. <laughs> it's really evolved. And, and the whole evolution has been amazing. Um, just to feel like, um, like Jeffrey Liu started that gallery on his own. And then people came in and did shows. I mean, it was just a major rough loft in Soho before it owned Soho was anything. And so the history of how the art enterprise has evolved is really, really fabulous. So there will be more movies, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we have sodas. We have books to sell. I encourage you to buy two copies, one for someone you love. And Mary's happy to sign them. Thanks again for being here, and especially thanks to our panel, and really thanks to Mary. <laughs>